The Five Eyes Alliance, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Suzanne, that's been around since uh, after the Second World War. Uh, initially created as a way for the UK and the US to share intelligence and then expanded to include uh, our close friends in Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And I'm delighted that we've got former heads of services in four of those countries uh, to have this discussion today, starting with uh, Sir John Scarlett, who was chief of the uh, British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, uh, from 2004 to 2009. Uh, we have John McLaughlin, who was acting director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, we have David Irvine. David was head of the both the Australian Secret Intelligence Service and their Security Intelligence Organisation. And we have Mr Richard Fadden, who was head of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and was later Canadian National Security Advisor. So four people with unparalleled knowledge and expertise uh, on these issues. Uh, so if I can start by asking each of you gentlemen to share briefly some thoughts about the importance of uh, alliances, the Five Eyes alliances, but maybe other strategic or potentially strategic alliances uh, of the sort we've been discussing. And if it, perhaps I can uh, ask you to talk in the order that I introduced you, introduced you, so perhaps asking Sir John Scarlett to kick off with a few thoughts and we'll go from there. John. Right, Nick, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? We can, we can. Yeah, right, uh, thank you. Well, my initial comments um, uh, from here, uh, you uh, rightly started, uh, and I'll run a risk of, of um, repeating, uh, the point about the importance of history. If we're really going to understand uh, the particular character of the Five Eyes relationship, you do have to know the history, the way it was built out of the intelligence relationship between the UK and uh, the United States uh, in the war, focused on communications, intercept, Bletchley Park, and, and, uh, and so on. Now, in 1946, this was turned into a formal agreement called Brusa, not Bruza, but B-R-U-S-A, uh, and uh, and then from the very beginning, what we then called uh, the Dominions, uh, Canada, Australia, and uh, New Zealand, of course, were automatically part of that. Um, in 1953, it became a UQ's here, and uh, it's developed into now the five um, uh, eyes. It was low profile, regular meetings, discussions, and close personal uh, contacts involved from all five countries. Uh, the trust, deep and personal, all of us here have experienced it, and I may say in more recent times than the one I was just, uh, ones I was just uh, referring to. <clears throat> now this basic format continued for decades, and during that time political relations were, between the countries concerned, were often quite complicated. You know, the Suez crisis obviously in 1956, the whole set of issues around uh, Vietnam, nuclear weapons issues, and this was before the growth of Chinese uh, power. But the point was that political differences did not impact the intelligence relationship. Note, I'm using the word relationship, not alliance, because you know, get a complicated area there. We may, may discuss that. I can't resist a key quote from back in the late 1960s from um, uh, Prescott Courier who was one of the original four United States visitors to Bletchley Park on the 8th of February 1941, which was the very beginning of the special relationship and the exchange of uh, the, the country's biggest secrets, the um, Enigma Code to Germany and the Purple Code to Japan. Um, he said, talking in the late 60s, that the relationship quotes, is still on a personal, friendly basis without any regard for what the politics of the moment may be. It doesn't seem to make any difference at all. We've never faltered. It's something that will probably continue indefinitely. Close that quote. Now, in brief, for decades, the Five Eyes has been low profile and not a policy-making structure or platform. 
In the last decade, as we all know, it has gained a much higher international uh, profile, essentially, this is from uh, Edward Snowden and so on, in what is a rapidly uh, changing global geopolitical uh, context. And it is becoming, and has become indeed, a platform for policy making and policy announcements. And we do need to think carefully about the implications um, of this. Five Eyes are all liberal democracies with shared values and belief in the rule of law, the, the rule of law within their own countries, and of course the rule of law um, internationally. So in a rapidly changing world, what are the key challenges we face? This is just me obviously putting some, some issues on the table. First, we have the pandemic. Now, what will be the long-term um, implications of the pandemic for the moment? We can see it accentuating, accentuating trends that were already underway, e.g. Uh, great power rivalry, the vaccine competition and all, all <clears throat> the rest of it. But how is that going to uh, develop? We Everybody likes talking about it now, but you know, nobody really knows by definition how it's going to be. Um, China, of course, well, that is certainly not a liberal democracy, but it has become a central part of the global economy. Under President Xi, uh, it is um, highly assertive international diplomacy and territorial ambition. But China's strength means that it has credibility. Adapting um, our relationships and our relationship to China is an unprecedented uh, challenge. It can't be compared to relations with the Soviet Union, and we should not use the Cold War parallel Equally, we shouldn't duck the issues that that parallel potentially uh, puts on the table. You know, it's complicated. <laughs> Russia, a different challenge. Compared to China, it may seem less, but Russia has recovered from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, you know, I was there at the time in the Soviet Union. I know what that collapse, collapse meant. Um, <clears throat> In the last 10 years, it has been acting with ruthlessness, great ruthlessness. The, U the Inter Inter Integrated Review in the UK just published with some quite confusing messages, as I was telling somebody who drafted it earlier on this morning, um, lists Russia as uh, the premier security threat to the UK, even though uh, the review loves talking about the tilt to the Indo-Pacific, which may be relevant in our discussion. Uh, I mean, ruthless uh, behavior by Russia across um, a whole range of activity still has the capacity to take us by surprise. But we need to think why that is. Very closely associated with the personality of President Putin. How do we react to this? Third point, US global leadership and alliances. And this actually is by chance picking up what David Petraeus was saying uh, yesterday. Now, the five eyes are essential uh, to this uh, question. The last four years uh, have raised, without me getting into too much detail, uncertainty about the future of US leadership. Quotes, America is now back, close quotes, thank goodness. T taking a firm position on China and Russia and looking forward to working closely with allies. But how does one translate that firm position into reality? and retain credibility whilst avoiding confrontation and conflict. The aim and the stated aim is to combine competition or confrontation with cooperation. Of course, that's an excellent aim and a concept, but how do you achieve it? And we're seeing the challenge and the nature of it um, you know, straight away, really, um, uh, as far as China is concerned with Taiwan, of course, and to some extent, Hong Kong, Russia with Ukraine, but also we have, you know, uh, more broadly, uh, the challenges in Afghanistan, which is what David Petraeus was talking about yesterday. And now, all of a sudden, we have Israel and Palestine back um, on people with quite a few people having just a few weeks ago thinking they sort of pushed that back into history. Now, these classical geopolitical questions are made more complicated by the um, evolution of conflict and, and warfare, hybrid warfare, and rapidly evolving technology are, are crucial, permeates everything. 
and how do we uh, counter this? Uh, information security, very much in, in, uh, involving uh, uh, and implicating, if you like, the five eyes, very visible challenge. Of course, we're just talking there about the colonial uh, pipeline and the other technology um, threats, which can affect um, all, all of us, of course, but Huawei certainly has. Um, and then, of course, the whole issue of political interference through disinformation. Now, that challenge has always been there uh, through what we used to call active measures. And I do remember from Aspen Security Forum back in 2016, when the news of the um, interference of the Democrat National Convention that was coming through and everybody was expressing surprise, or at least many people were, around the security forum. And I was asked for an opinion. And I, I said, well, speaking as somebody who used to deal with active measures, I, I'm asking, why are you so surprised? Yeah, this, this, this is what happens. But of course, it's become vastly more efficient and effective in, in, the, in the new age. I mean, it's only recently we have come to see its full scale and complexity. Final point. Um, Increasing amount of talk, of course, with the high profile for Five Eyes about Five Eyes Plus. One of the obvious consequences um, of the publicity since um, Edward Snowden. And of course, well, we've all met people um, from particular countries. Um, I'm not, I have to add, um, or hasten, I hasten to add, from, amongst allied countries from France. Nobody in France seems to want to join the Five Eyes. I haven't noticed that for my own reason. Uh, but certainly from uh, Japan and Germany, for example. Uh, and we need to discuss that too. Um, uh, and to understand somehow or another, how does one manage that question? Because I think I'm right in saying, but correct me if I'm wrong, that everybody here would say, you can't really add, you can't make five eyes, six eyes. It's just that if you've worked within it, it just you know, wouldn't work. Um, it's not a rational thing. Uh, but the fact is that we have, and certainly want to have, very, very tight and close relationships um, and intelligence and security relationships with other major countries. And I like to add that uh, in the UK's case, our oldest intelligence ally is France, dating back to March 1911. And I've certainly got a lot of experience of this, although I'm not wearing the relevant medal at the moment. So, um, uh, how do we develop such relationships and, and keep them dynamic or make them even more dynamic uh, without complicating the five eyes issue? I'll stop there. Okay, John, thanks. That's that's a lot there. And I think the way we're going to do this is rather than come straight in with questions based on what you said, we're going to hear thoughts from everybody and then uh, we'll, we'll open it up to questions. So, John McLaughlin, would you mind uh, going next with your thoughts, please, John. Uh, thank you, Nick. And is my audio okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different approach, uh, although I, I agree with everything that John just said, Sir John. But I uh, am going to talk about these services more in terms of their character and what that means in the world of intelligence and some of the challenges that flow from that talk about that as distinct from going through some of the issues substantively that uh, Sir John Scarlett has just discussed. So uh, let me say this, when I look around the world and I, I divide all of the services that the United States intelligence deals with into uh, categories, I come up with about four. Uh, there are relations with intelligence services that are generally friendly, and there are many of those who are outside of the Five Eyes relationship. There are relations with those who are, I would call them neither friend nor foe, and you can imagine who they, who they might be. And then finally, there are relations we have with intelligence services in adversary countries who nonetheless share some range, narrow range of interests with us. And then there is our Five Eyes grouping which frankly is in a category by itself for all of the reasons that Sir John Scarlett just mentioned. But I think at the core of that is a trust, a trust that has built up over many years of, of doing together things that are difficult, sometimes dangerous, 
and vitally important to our mutual security. Now, looking at our collective future, I can see three challenges for us that are unique to the changing times we live in. And they draw on the special qualities at the heart of this uh, Five Eyes relationship. <clears throat> the first has to do with the nature of truth. The tradecraft we use in these services, that's the term we use for those who aren't uh, intelligence uh, aficionados, for tradecraft, basically the, the methods we use to carry out operations and to do analysis. That tradecraft is designed to narrow the range of uncertainty and to peel away things that are false, misleading, or just the kind of deliberate uh, disinformation that Sir John referred to. Uh, when I have the opportunity to brief people in Congress or elsewhere, one of the most frequent questions I get is, how do I know what's true? How do I know what to believe? That results from all sorts of things having to do with the misinformation and disinformation that is floating around these days, largely through the volume of information on social media, but, but it's it's also uh, something that simply flows from the fact that people are inundated with information these days from all directions. So for us, the question is actually one of curating all of that and and using the kind of tradecraft we we rely on to determine what is actually true, what is approximate reality in the midst of all of that. So there's a vital mission for us, stripping away illusion, misinformation, deep fakes, and getting to the truth. That's a mission that has always been at the center of what we do, but now it's vitally important that we really get it right. It's moved even more decisively to the center. Now, the second challenge has to do with uh, what might be called a rising tide of autocracy in the world that poses a challenge to democratic systems. Uh, John Le Carré, in one of his novels, once had a character say, and here I quote, that secret services were the only real measure of a nation's political health the only real expression of its subconscious. Now, I teach graduate students these days, and I often will put that up on the board and just ask them, what do you think that means? And a very healthy discussion ensues. But our services, the Five Eyes, live and work in open, free, and remarkably transparent societies, reporting to and taking direction from freely elected leaders. Now, projecting and proselytizing this model for intelligence governance in the world is a contribution we can uniquely make at this moment, and one that I recall trying to make after the Soviet Union broke up and we were confronted with a, a world in which many intelligence services had to make transitions from one type of society to another, and we see that in many other parts of the world now. So when democracy is challenged in so many parts of the world and when some intelligence services uh, are, are pressured into serving autocrats instead of publics, that's a particularly important mission for us to uh, proselytize this way of integrating intelligence into open free societies and yet remaining secret and effective. The third challenge, and here I'll, I'll wrap up, it flows from the fact that we live in the midst of the greatest technological revolution of modern times. Now, we've been through technological revolutions before, of course, but earlier ones, at least the ones in modern times that most of us would remember, uh, were based largely on advances in physics and engineering. And think back to nuclear weaponry and air power and a kind of uh, weaponry and technology we saw during the Cold War and after. All of those continue, but added to them now are astounding advances in information technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and biology, 
and many others, nanotechnology, and all of these kind of fusing together in ways that are challenging, confusing, and um, that are embraced by some of our allies and many of our uh, adversaries, more importantly. So our services, existing as they do in advanced societies and uniquely positioned to integrate these emerging technologies into our work, and also guard against the dangers they may pose in the hands of those who mean us ill. Our, our services are uniquely positioned to, to do those things and to uh, advance along with this technical technological revolution in ways that make our intelligence more effective and that guard against the kind of things that we have seen most recently in the United States that Suzanne referred to with the pipeline hacking and so forth. Because these technologies are so complex and advancing so rapidly, they are a commanding arena for deeper cooperation among our five services. So I, I'm going to stop there, having laid out three challenges that I think are unique to these times and that draw on the strengths of our services in this uh, unique grouping. Thank you very much, Nick and Suzanne, and uh, thank you all for attending. It's great to be with my colleagues here. Great to have you. Thanks, John. It's great to have you. Thanks for those three uh, really uh, uh, stimulating challenges, which I'm sure will come up in discussion as it proceeds later. But first, I'm going to ask uh, David Irvine if he could kindly share his thoughts on the Five Eyes relationships with us, please, David. Well, thank you very much for um, having me uh, today. I, I am, am certainly extremely stimulated by um, the remarks of Sir John and, uh, and John McLaughlin. Um, and uh, I just want to, if I may, uh, follow up on a couple of points. Um, look, the, the, the Five Eyes construct is not a formal alliance per se. It grew as a discrete, and I use the word discrete in both senses of the pun, um, a discrete intelligence sharing arrangements be between five countries with shared values. And look, frankly, it served us immensely well. It's, it's added additional value to the intelligence efforts of any one partner. And it survived because it remains highly relevant, it remains highly productive, and it continues to add value. And it's done that by developing and adapting its scope to address the changing intelligence challenges, the changing threats of the day. And of course, um, the whole theme of this conference is, is just what is changing. Um, and, and if we talk about the intelligence operating environment in the strategic in the strategic operating environment in the 21st century, we've we've got a situation where yes, we have new powers coming onto the stage, challenging old um, established uh, um, the old established order for 70 years and so on. Um, but it's a it's a new environment where economics, where technology, and the cyber world itself are being weaponized in so-called hybrid or, or gray warfare. And this has required the intelligence function to adapt to new threats in new areas and constantly having to adapt to new technologies. Um, and at the same time, those new threats and those new technologies and the nature and the scope of those threats are increasingly forcing Five Eyes partners to work, as John McLaughlin pointed out, with like-minded partners who are outside the Five Eyes intelligence framework, and, in, and, and some not so like-minded. And so um, we constantly have to ask ourselves the question, is an historically closed, exclusive, members-only construct created for the sharing of intelligence, is that the best vehicle for the um, pursuit of our common strategic goals? Um, when we actually need to pursue those goals in cooperation with many other non-Five Eyes partners. And, and, and in our area, Japan, Korea, the old ASEANs, uh, and Vietnam, and where possible, the, new, the Europeans spring for mind. And from an intelligence point of view, it's not just um, the concept of state-based threats that we need to think about. 
the growing incidence of cybercrime and its impact on our critical infrastructure, on our way of life and so on, um, is requiring much broader international cooperation, which I believe goes beyond the Five Eyes kind of construct. But having said that, fully integrating new partners into the established Five Eyes intelligence sharing construct is always going to be difficult for the reasons that uh, both Johns um, have, have, have raised. But we must find a way to work with other partners. And I believe this can be achieved bilaterally, as we've been doing, or more broadly, but it will always depend on the ability and the willingness of the prospective non-Five Eyes partners to actually share intelligence and to protect the intelligence that's been shared. Now, look, that sort of cooperation isn't without precedent. For goodness sake, for the last 20 years, the Five Eyes have been working and cooperating very successfully with like-minded and non-like-minded um, countries in countering Islamist terrorism. Um, and, and I believe that that model can, can be adapted successfully to address this new range of threats that we're talking about. Um, and it can be done with a range of like-minded partners without destroying the essential character and integrity and value, if you like, of the current Five Eyes construct. Now, a very different question, in, in a sense, arises with the recent moves that John mentioned to convert the Five Eyes concept from its original um, purely intelligence sharing purpose into a broader policy devising and policy implementing mechanism. We have to ask ourselves, how far should this go? And will it detract from the core business of the Five Eyes, the original business of the Five Eyes, which was to enhance decision making through the collection and sharing of intelligence. Um, and, and, and it raises a number of questions. For example, how would this broader Five Eyes policy devising uh, concept, labelled Five Eyes, managing the public differences of view on strategic policy, which um, you know, arise from time to time between participants. And that's not just a, um, um, a, a question for theorists. Um, the public catalyst for that particular question are the comments made in April by the New Zealand Foreign Minister, who directly criticised efforts to pressure China through the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Group. Um, she said in, in, in April, the Five Eyes should focus on intelligence. Uh, she said, we would much prefer um, to look for multilateral opportunities to express our, i.e. New Zealand interests on a number of issues. That's a matter we've raised with the Five Eyes partners. We are uncomfortable with expanding the remit of the, of the Five Eyes relationship. And so it raises an immediate question of, can you use the rubric of Five Eyes on policy making matters when everyone knows that at least one set of eyes is not marching to the same tune? Or should we find other forums, other vehicles for the pursuit of our common strategic goals, uh, including in relation in our area anyway, um, in, in, in China? And so, it, you know, we, there, there are certain things we, I think we need to be very, care, uh, very aware of and careful about. Um, to turn the Five Eyes construct into a, uh, a policy devising and policy implementation vehicle comes with some risks. Will it, for example, weaken the focus of the original tent on intelligence sharing and collection? I frankly think that it probably won't, but it is a question you need to ask yourselves. Will it become um, a vehicle for potential public dissent amongst the Five Eyes on issues of public policy that had previously been handled in other forums, not bearing the intelligence rubric? Um, And that, of course, is always a risk of any international partnership. Um, and then on many of the issues of these non-intelligence but strategic policy questions, we actually need much broader alliances and common ground with many countries that are not part of the Five Eyes. Um, and and uh, given that there is always some suspicion of the Five Eyes 
um, outside the construct, you know, how successful will this be? Well, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, and there's, a, there's actually another risk in relation to using the Five Eyes Intelligence Group as a policy platform, uh, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Um, reliance, for example, on the Five Eyes construct to develop a regional approach to, say, Chinese assertiveness, gives grist to the mill to those who are seeking to call out and exploit, uh, to, to, to use the words of one of my colleagues here in Australia, the perfidy of the ex-imperial powers and their former white dominions. It's a little interesting thing that um, none of us give much thought to until it gets thrown back at us as it has quite recently. So we need to be mindful of these risks as we pursue uh, common strategic policy objectives. Um, and, and there are other mechanisms available. Um, there's the whole ASEAN-based regional architecture in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we have the newly um, formed concept of the Quad uh, involving US, Japan, India uh, and, and, uh, and Australia. Uh, and, and through those sorts of uh, um, uh, mechanisms, including bilateral efforts, we, I think we can work more closely with our regional partners. So I, I focused in on, on, on a couple of very specific aspects, but I, ask, I do think that um, given all the challenges we face, we also need to think very carefully about the extent to which um, we expand this intelligence sharing construct into a broader policy making, strategic uh, policy making construct. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Well, that's very clearly setting out some of the. Uh... Uh, conundrums and potential risks in that expanding the role of Five Eyes in the way that you described is from intelligence sharing to uh, policy evolution. We'll look at those issues in a minute. But first, can I ask uh, Dick Fadden to lead uh, uh, with a Canadian perspective, please, Dick? Thanks very much, Nick. Um, when Suzanne asked me to participate in this panel, she said she hoped that we wouldn't all take the same perspective. And I'm going to contribute to that desire because I'm going to take a slightly different perspective again. Some years ago, I was responsible in our prime minister's department for the machinery of government branch, which was the, grant, the branch that advised the prime minister on the creation of agencies and departments and dissolutions and whatnot. I think there's some lessons to be learned there for alliances and relationships. So I've retained a couple of principles that I'd like to bring to bear on our discussion today, one of which is form should follow substance. Um, substantive change should not always mean changes in form, but if we do mean move towards changing form, we should accept that a fair bit of disruption is likely to follow. I think these are probably applicable to either alliances or the relationship that John Scarlett was talking about. I'm going to break a couple of public speaking rules and articulate two self-evident, two or three self-evident facts for all states, particularly today, but especially for middle powers, um, alliances are a default. If you don't participate in alliances, you're like China or Russia, and we don't want to be like them. Alliances for the West are an extraordinary advantage over the other two countries I've just mentioned. And more importantly for what I'm going to say in a few minutes, alliances can be either strategic, tactical, or what I call organic. And I'll come back to that in a second or two. So turning to the five eyes, um, like many alliances, it was born, as John Scarlett said, in a time of adversity as a defensive measure against a common enemy. And as is true even in bureaucratic wars, if you fight the wars together, you bond and you develop trust. And if you do this over a number of years, it really does create a different kind of organization. If you add to this the similar history, the values of the five, it leads me to suggest that our the relationship really is organic. And by that, I mean that uh, acknowledging that it has no formal constitution or rules, that the cooperation is in fact quasi spontaneous. And I don't think you can say this about very many other organizations, either in the intelligence field or anywhere outside of that area. So the above suggests to me that the expansion to six or eight or 10 eyes would fundamentally change the organic bond. 
Uh, this despite the multiplicity of, the, you know, of existing relationships that the others have talked about. From Canada's perspective, I think the benefits of the Five Eyes are beyond rational debate. Having said this, the alliance does not permeate foreign defense and policy thinking. Rather, it generates a mindset. And I think that's also true to some degree in the other countries that constitute the Five Eyes. From this perspective, from the initial Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, numerous other groups, immigration, border issues, law enforcement, have grown up over the, over the decades. I was responsible for our immigration department for a number of years, and I was surprised to learn that there was a quintet modeled on the Five Eyes, did exactly the same thing the Intelligence Alliance did, but it did this in the immigration area. And I think we in the intelligence area tend to underestimate the fact that the Five Eyes Alliance, Intelligence Alliance has a number of offsprings in government. And that if we use these more consciously, we may be able to avoid some of the difficulties that David Irvine was just talking about in the sense of staying away a little bit from getting into the public policy area. So I, I confess that a few years ago when I was working, I, I thought that an expansion of the Five Eyes would make some sense, but you will have gathered by now that I don't agree with that. I was a bit surprised, Sir John, to hear you say that the French don't want to join, because I can remember on a couple of occasions over lunches in Paris, contrary view being expressed and wanting to know who the heck was against the French joining. Anyway, times change. Um, having said all of this, uh, I do think we should not just pack up and say the five eyes are picture perfect and we need to work on relationships. So I'd like to just put out for discussion another angle. I suggest that we take a page from the G7 and create something of the order of a nine eyes while retaining the five eyes as it is today, but using the five eyes as the core of the new six or seven or eight eyes. Um, I recognize that creating a new grouping in a world with more groupings than we probably need is likely not going to be met with terrible applause. But I think if you talk about, if we think about the environment in which we're living and that my co-panelists have mentioned already, Acknowledging that growing the five eyes in a manner of speaking through the way that I've just suggested, while still maintaining the core, may help us deal with some of the threats that everybody's talked about. Um, so maybe it's a seven eyes while still maintaining the five eyes on the side. I guess my only caveat would be, uh, if we're going to do this, uh, we shouldn't expand to too large a number. Uh, at the risk of offending anybody, I think NATO went down this path incorrectly and expanded too quickly with too many countries, and we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't duplicate what they're doing. So, my basic point is, if it's not broken, let's not try and fix it. The Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance is not broken, so let's not try and fix it. But let's acknowledge that with the changes in the world and our environment, there may be some advantage to adding two or three other countries and create something of the order of a seven or eight eyes while still maintaining what we have now. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. That was great. Well, that's four very different and interesting uh, takes on the issue of the of what the Five Eyes is about, what it can be about. Uh, can I just ask one question of the panelists, Suzanne, and then perhaps you want to come in or invite Absolutely. questions? Absolutely. I guess it's this point about policy. I mean, I'd always seen the Five Eyes as essentially an intelligence sharing organize, uh, re set of relationships, as, as, as the speakers have said. It's about intelligence sharing between people you trust so much you can share intelligence on a very deep level and uh, almost reflexively. Um, if it's now being talked about as somehow as a, as a, as a policy uh, capability, can we get that genie back in the bottle or have we got to deal with it now as something that's got into the policy space? John McLaughlin, you look as if you got an idea. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, of course, uh, I have been out of government for uh, a while, and I haven't heard direct engagement by active duty officers on this issue. So I'm sure there's more to the story than I know. But on the surface, the, the principle of engaging 
policy in the Five Eyes arena or having the Five Eyes be some sort of vanguard of policy or a policy forum strikes me as not a good idea because in the uh, at least in the American context we try to draw a pretty bright line between uh, policy and intelligence I mean the standard phrase we use is we inform policy we don't make policy mm -hmm. and in those instances where we have gotten close to policy it usually has not worked out well for one reason or another the theory being i think it's more than a theory i think it's human nature is that if you begin to engage in policy uh, you, you will begin to invest in the policy and you'll become less of an objective observer of it now that's i'm going to stop in a moment but that that said uh, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, intelligence officers all have policy views. We just don't bring them into our professional work. Uh, and I've been pressed by presidents in the past to say, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And I've usually begun by saying, well, you understand, Mr. President, that it's not my role. I'm the intelligence officer and so forth. And I've had at least one president say to me, yeah, I know that, but I also know you have a policy view. So tell me. Mm -hmm. And pressed in that circumstance, you will reveal your view, but with that caveat. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it's a little dangerous to drop that wall. Mm -hmm. Sure. that you wanted to come in, I think. <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, we're thinking about this, uh, uh, as we can see from this discussion, and it needs uh, thinking about. And this is a current issue. So it's, you know, the thinking is developing now. Um, I, you know, we can. I mean, D Dix made the point uh, that he's come across, you know, an equivalent called the quintet in the mm -hmm. area of immigration, uh, and you know, that's a very interesting point which needs a bit more thinking. I've just been talking earlier on this morning with uh, Australian uh, what, counterparts, not intelligence counterparts, um, about other examples where, on a bilateral basis, uh, the kind of um, yeah, uh, intimate sort of very close and deep uh, relationships in different policy areas can uh, develop and obviously that um, that was quite demanding just in a bilateral basis uh, given the, the the depth and trust involved and so on so obviously to try and do that um, on a five eyes basis is going to be more difficult but it I mean the quintet suggests that there are certain areas where it can be done and so there's room for good constructive thinking and not negative thinking there where um, I, I have a problem um, when I'm reacting to this is that, of course, what's happened recently is that uh, the Five Eyes concept has been used self-consciously and deliberately as a political platform and as a platform for making statements on complicated international um, issues. And that's been done sort of deliberately by the government's concern. And almost certainly they didn't think it through. Uh, they just went for what they saw as an easy platform and they just assumed that it would uh, would work it wasn't given it wasn't given a uh, careful thought now in our own case in the uk um that reflects in fact i first saw it really coming forward um in 2015 2016 which was two or three years after snowden uh, and in the context of the brexit uh, debate where literally very senior politicians were saying we don't need Europe as uh, our security partners because we've got the Five Eyes. And when I challenged, uh, he'll remain nameless, the particular senior politician, a very senior politician, and actually quite the, well, a definitely intelligent one, so I'll add that point um, uh, to it. He, he said, OK, fair enough. I don't really know what I'm talking about. You know. <laughs> uh, but it was very easily put onto the public debate and in a potentially very damaging away by people however clever who didn't really know anything about it uh, and we've really got to be careful of, of that that's how i'd like to come back on the issue mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Uh, anything to add sorry sorry susan no, no. um yeah, just just one point i think in a sense the genie is out of the bottle um uh, and the, uh, from from the point of view of uh, Five Eyes Intelligence Cooperation, we need to con to find ways to continue um, what it has been doing so successfully um, and, and, and we, we must in seek to ensure that the um, 
uh, use of the Five Eyes rubric for uh, other purposes never um, gets to the point where it, it, it destroys the intelligence cooperation. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I would much prefer that um, uh, other rubrics were chosen um, because um, although the genie is out of the bottle in this one, in, 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 in the recent case where um, it was described as a Five Eyes uh, condemnation of Chinese human rights policies in, in Xinjiang, for example, one, one partner uh, disassociated uh, uh, itself from, from that from that uh, common position, which basically weakened the position completely in, in, in so many ways. So I think, um, uh, I think yes, we, while the genie is currently out of the bottle, it would be far preferable to find other sorts of uh, mechanisms for expressing um, common political goals um, uh, in so far as you can um, get away from using that rubric and to keep uh, but to ensure that uh, the intelligence cooperation goes on unabated. Great. Thank you. And before we move on, I'd like to ask Dick, who I think wanted to say something on this. Thank you. No, I agree with what uh, my fellow panelists have said, but I'd just like to, to press a little bit the point that I was trying to make in my remarks. Uh, I think it's possible to isolate the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance from the Five Eyes writ large. I mean, uh, if you have a Five Eyes equivalent of the quintet in between foreign ministries. Let them talk about it as much as they want. Uh, I really have been struck when I worked outside of the national security community, how much our five countries collaborate outside of the intelligence world using that mindset that I was talking about. So I think if we pushed back using the intelligence component and still accepted that the five eyes countries have something to say together, we may be able to deal with the genie that David was just talking about. Worth, worth pursuing at any rate, I think. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Suzanne? Yeah, I think those are wonderful thoughts. You know, um, one thing comes to mind, we have a great question here from Brandon McCartney, which I'm going to introduce in just a moment, but I just want to first sort of add the backdrop of what nearly all of you have mentioned, um, which is the emerging technology and how much technology impacts um, the ability to gather and share intelligence uh, with trusted partners. And Brandon's question is related to the conversation in today's world in which corporations have reached the political influence level and intelligence gathering level in some areas of countries. And he asked how the panel views partnering with corporations. What are the dangers? What are the checks and balances? I, I understand that it would be a very different type of alliance um, than what is currently the five eyes, but how are each of you thinking about the emerging technologies and private companies holding so much information, being able to pull from that information quickly. How might that impact the future of Five Eyes? And John, I see you. Will you go, and go ahead first? Yeah, I think this is part of a larger um, issue that we, we're we beginning, to, we're talking a lot about in the intelligence world now, which is the, let's call it the open source revolution. And the, the truth of it is that much uh, of the data that 20 years ago would be gathered by intelligence is now gathered in the private sector. Uh, there is now a robust uh, private source of imagery from space with analysts who look at it and assess it responsibly and credibly. There is even a kind of open source SIGINT, if you will, in terms of programs that track ships at sea and, and, uh, and some aspects of space. And we're seeing this in all sorts of places. I mean, do, you, do most people know that the New York Times now has something called a visual uh, investigation unit, I think it's called. And they just put out a really impressive study of illicit oil movements to North Korea based on a combination of imagery, open source SIGINT, uh, cinematography, which they contracted for and document research. That just wouldn't have happened 20, 20 years ago in the same way it does now. So your, your consumers of intelligence now have many other sources for getting information that is competitive. So I think that's the reason why intelligence, among other things, has to step up its game on, on the use of technology. And 
also I'll make this final comment. I believe that that phenomenon begins to narrow the area in which we must focus our precious and expensive classified sensitive collection techniques uh, really onto the hardest targets that the private sector cannot get at and and that's hard they're hard targets because they're hard we even call them hard targets so uh, that's that's my initial thought on that it's a very important thing going on right now that we need to recognize mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about thoughts from any, David? If, if I may, um, there's, there's, there's the other side of the coin uh, to um, what um, uh, John has talked about, and that is that um, uh, increasingly national security is dependent upon uh, national resilience, is dependent on the ability of um, the companies operating our critical infrastructure, the companies managing um, our national data, um, be it health data or whatever, um, those companies are in increasingly required to be able to um, protect um, their, um, their, their service delivery um, against, uh, for example, cyber attack. And, um, and, and, and so that the other side of the coin is that there's actually a requirement for much um, greater levels of cooperation between um, industry uh, and and governments where a lot of the expertise of course lies in terms of cyber security and protecting um, uh, critical elements of our economy of our national life um, against um, attacks which don't necessarily have to be um, state-based attacks um, they can be you know the incidence of cyber crime and 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 the the joyriding hackers um, who 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 can actually um, stop systems and um, pull down electricity grids and so on. So the, there is a there is a growing um, demand from industry for government support in cybersecurity, and uh, I believe that there's a growing demand on the part of government for industry to get their acts together. So there's a huge element of cooperation required there, which we are only just beginning to explore, at least here in Australia. Mm -hmm. John Scarlett, your thoughts? Well, just picking uh, that up, we need to, of course, we don't really need reminding uh, that uh, solar winds, for example, uh, is a classic example of that interaction, uh, private sector and government. After all, it was uh, private companies, um, including one that you're going to be hearing from shortly. Uh, uh, that were the origin um, of, of that. And, and on also the whole Huawei issue, uh, which of course has been a big FIFI's issue, uh, is again um, very much interlinked uh, between sort of the private sector, well actually the private sector in our own countries uh, and, uh, and government. And then of course that automatically brings in the full range of issues relating to China in particular, and the, you know, what exactly is the private sector in uh, in in China, the state-owned enterprises and, and 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 all the rest of it. So you know, it's completely correct. Where you know it's become much much more complicated um, in that way, uh, which is another reason, in my view, for being careful here and sort of really thinking through, you know, what we're um, what we're we're doing, given how if it gets too complicated, then we will start. Uh, risk or risk damaging uh, what we've already um, uh, achieved. I think that's fair. Um, we are we are running a little bit tight on time, but we have a question uh, that I would like to introduce a special panelist to ask himself. Um, former uh, director of national intelligence, Jim Clapper, is, has been listening in and has a, a question to ask, I believe, each of you. So we're going to give him just a moment to appear magically. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm fine, Suzanne. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you great, sir. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Well, I, it was uh, uh, first uh, an honor and privilege to listen to so many good uh, colleagues and friends from uh, prior life. And uh, I thought I'd uh, share with everybody, uh, you probably can't see it, but this is a replica of a memo that was presented to me by Robert Hannigan when he was director of GCHQ. Uh, this would have been about 20, early 2016, I think, my last uh, trip to the UK. 
And uh, what the memo says, it's signed by the uh, combined chief of, uh, chief of staff, and it's dated uh, February of uh, 1942. And one simple page uh, typewritten, it just lays out the uh, arrangements for sharing with General Eisenhower, who was then in his planning staff, about to come to London. And it simply says, we will share all special intelligence with General Eisenhower and, and his staff, and General Eisenhower and his staff will share all special intelligence with us. And that's kind of the uh, origins of the uh, Five Eyes arrangement, what, you know, what grew into the Five Eyes. So and on my last, uh, my farewell trips to all the Five Eyes countries, I did, uh, I was asked to do town halls uh, with uh, various employees. In fact, uh, David may recall, I did uh, th three or four town halls uh, in uh, Canberra. And, and inevitably, I'd get a question, or even if I didn't, I'd figure out some way to work it into the conversation about, well, what, what do you think the future of the alliance is? So I said, I believe that an idea whose time maybe hasn't come yet is we ought to eliminate the no foreign caveat in our relationship with the Five Eyes allies in an intelligence context. Now, I, I always avoided saying that in front of my general counsel who went apoplectic whenever I bring that up because of all the legal complications. But I, and the reason I say this is because having lived through 50 or 55 years of history of the relationship, and I authorized many, many exceptions for Five Eyes members to be in various uh, locales in the US intelligence community where they would have free and open access to US intelligence. So in terms of, inst instead of broadening the relationship to other nations, I would advocate deepening it and simply extend dual citizenship privileges to uh, those who are in, it, when whenever we're in each other's intelligence footprint, uh, because I believe the relationship has matured uh, to that point and that uh, I believe, uh, I mean, there would be certain uh, legal obligations that uh, we'd have to, uh, uh, assume, and each each person involved in this arrangement would have to. But I think that is, uh, and I, at least in nothing else, it is a testament to what my belief in the importance, the crucial importance of the, five, of the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. And I agree, I think John, uh, if I heard correctly, in fact, I think everybody spoke to this about, you know, staying out of the policy lanes, let others do that. And uh, because my observation has been there's been a continuity of, of uh, the depth of the relationship with it, within intelligence channels, regardless of the vagaries of the of the governments as they came and went in each of our countries. So I just thought in the uh, uh, towards the end of this session, I'd say something provocative. <laughs> Excellent. And any kind of response to, to that thinking of uh, making the relationship uh, deeper? Uh, within the current Five Eyes members. I'm, I'm interested to hear reaction. And we can actually kind of flow right into what my final question was going to be of each of you, which is, what does a future alliance look like? Is it still Five Eyes? Uh, is it is it we sort of take what works and build in the technology functions and the private sector functions? Like, what does the future look like? Well, if I might, Suzanne, as long as I'm buttoning in here, um, what I think, what, if you if you buy that, <laughs> which I know is a big leap for some people, then we would have an, another a layer or concentric circle, as I would envision, of other countries that would now that would then occupy what is now called the second part of relationship. And there are any number of countries that I think could be considered, assuming they want to uh, they want to join. Um, so to me, that would be the nature of the, of the the change in the relationship is to deepen the what's now the Five Eyes, and then broaden what we now think of as a second party arrangement, uh, have other countries uh, fill that, that, that circle. John Scarlett, would you like to lead us off? <clears throat> okay, fi uh, this is final comment uh, maybe from, from me, and we've got to move on. Uh, just picking up uh, 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 Jim's point there um, about foreigners and treating foreigners. In, in fact, in my memory, but this goes back a little bit uh, now. Uh, I, I mean, most of uh, Five Eyes partners, I found in my brain, I wasn't thinking of them as foreigners at all. 
and, and I wasn't thinking of their of their countries and services as foreign services and the interlinking and all the various ways in which we did you know it meant that concept didn't hold now with the United States there was there was definitely an exception um, it was um, difficult to say that one didn't regard the, the US or Americans as foreigners uh, partly for legal reasons and partly just because of the sheer scale and, and, and implications um, uh, of that uh, so uh, I would just say uh, to you Jim that the sort of not foreigners point is already there actually in the way we behave uh, to a very significant extent and um, that, that is quite meaningful. Uh, secondly, uh, picking up the point about well, what is you know what what does the future hold? I think one of the things this discussion has done is flag up a whole lot of things that even within our present structure we've actually got to do to get right, which is going to be very demanding, and not least the whole management of the relationship with the private sector and all the various complexities that we. Um, we just discussed. And the final point, I'm going to go back to Dick here because he made the very good rejoinder to me on uh, on uh, partnership and work with uh, with France. And uh, uh, I remember one of um, uh, one of my uh, former colleagues in the service referring to me as an agent français. So I'm uh, well known for being biased in this in in this area. Uh, but at, at the point, I'm, well, I think the point I'm making was fairly obvious that they. It wasn't just wasn't their style, and I was really meaning uh, that remark and that little anecdote to be a compliment to them. I'm guessing they would take it as a compliment, John McLaughlin. I, I'm all in favor of Jim's uh, Jim Clapper's idea, and uh, of course the the details would be difficult, and you'd have to work through all of that. But the basic concept is an appealing one to me, uh, and. It, it, and I think the burden would be mostly on the United States. In other words, I think it's the US that tends to be most resistant to the principle behind uh, Jim Clapper's suggestion. Not that we are somehow walling off our partners, but we're, we're more uh, careful and strict about uh, simple things like uh, integrating into our buildings and agencies and basically walking in and sitting down with everyone else without restrictions. Uh, now, I say that that we should we should break that down and work through the details to do it. Uh, partly because I've, I've had the experience with uh, at least one of these services, and the person will know who I'm talking about, where I've actually been welcomed into their service without restrictions and actually written reports on their systems in their embassies using their classification. And it and nothing bad happened uh, as a result of all that. And uh, so I, I favor Jim Clapper's idea. On your, on your question, Suzanne, about what the future holds, I, that's a tougher one. We've all talked about it here. But if I were to single out two ideas that I take away as ones I would have robust discussion of among colleagues if I was still in the government. The first one is there is, I think, uh, some inexorable need, pressure, or reality to expand the five eyes in some way, not, not to make it literally six eyes, seven eyes, eight eyes with full privileges, but uh, let, let's face it, as intimate and lasting as this relationship is, it, it was forged in an event, the largest single event in human history, World War II, that happened, you know, 75 years ago. And a lot's happened since then in the world. And we're now, we've been through a couple more wars, not of that scale, and we're in many other struggles now that require multilateral approaches um, pick out one well i wouldn't call what we're dealing with with china as a struggle but it is a it is a challenge to figure out where is china going to fit in this whole arena and it's different than any challenge the united states has ever faced because in the past when we've had competitors we our job has just been to defeat them uh, you know whether it was <laughs> the nazis or the Soviet Union or terrorism. That's not what's going on with China. The, 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 
the task is to figure out how to compete with them successfully. We don't know yet whether at the end of history they will be our adversary, partner, or competitor. We don't know that. Uh, and that's a huge issue that requires multilateral collaboration on a scale we haven't had to deal with before. So I, I think the pressure to have the five eyes reach out more is, is there, and the, the particulars and the details are to be determined. That's it. Thank you. Dick, would you like to uh, share your thoughts on that and any closing thoughts as well? Sure. Uh, I think John Clapper's idea is a very good one, and it's worth pursuing, but let me just raise two thoughts that I think we need to take into account if we go down that path. One is, as you further integration throughout the intelligence community, I think we have to acknowledge that the distinctions between things international and things domestic is becoming rather blurred. And further uh, inclusion of everybody in each of our countries' intelligence community will give rise to the question of how we deal with domestic security, how we have other countries deal directly with that issue. It's something that's more sensitive than dealing with things international, I think. I think it's resolvable, but I think we need to talk about it. And secondly, since you know Suzanne says I'm supposed to represent the Canadian point of view, I think going down the path that John Clapper suggests will work in Canada, but the initial reaction will be, oh my God, you want John Clapper and John McLaughlin's people in our inner basements knowing everything that we're doing when they have to share everything that they know with everybody in the United States? I think that's resolvable, but you know, it's it is it's the elephant that will be in the room when we first go down that that path. And I think we should we should talk about it up in an upfront manner. I didn't have a chance to comment on the last conversation about uh, the private sector, so I just want to take advantage. I think uh, collaboration is necessary, it's ongoing, and it's a good thing. But I think we have to be careful to not go down the Chinese path and make the private sector an instrumentality of our intelligence agencies. It is too easy to do that. And before we know it, it without thinking about it, we'll have uh, our intelligence agencies using everyone and everything in much the same way as the Chinese are capable of doing. So collaboration by all means, but we need to be a little bit careful about the form it takes. So I'll stop there. That's a great point, uh, a great point. Definitely something we're thinking through. David. Um, look, uh, I, I listen carefully to what John McLaughlin said. Um, I, I, I agree that there is scope for um, expanding um, intelligence cooperation and, and, and sharing um, uh, uh, much more widely um, with, with like-minded countries. Um, and, and as I've said before, I think the, um, the example of what we've been through in the last 20 years with counterterrorism um, is, is one model. Um, in looking for, um, for future areas of cooperation, where you can expand the, um, um, the, the levels of participation, um, but in my view, continuing to keep the five eyes as your core uh, unit. Um, I probably wouldn't look to China first, uh, because I think um, uh, the, the, when, when I look at um, the various so-called like-minded um, countries and their attitudes towards China, they differ greatly. Um, um, they all have um, various, uh, very different interests that they want to protect with China, um, and and therefore their their approaches um, um, are likely to be different, difficult, uh, different, and that will I think um, impact on the ability to share intelligence in that particular area. But a much more fruitful area for um, uh, for broadening intelligence cooperation surely lies in cyber security because there we are all facing the same sorts of problems. We're looking for the same sorts of solutions. And I think, I think that is um, um, an area we should be looking at uh, much more closely. And in, of course, indeed we are. Yeah, Nick, that's definitely something we, uh, we will be bringing into uh, tomorrow's conversation as we talk about uh, the importance of international cooperation on cyber. Um, we'll share your thoughts and ideas on this. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to have this conversation. I think, you know, these things are front and center. They're well worth thinking through. I think we've heard from almost everybody who's spoken to us uh, yesterday and today about the importance of alliances moving forward, how critical it's going to be to get this right. 
So I really would like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and we'll carry this conversation forward as well. So thank you. Thank you.